Everybody, thanks for attending. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Joe Miguez. I will tell you a little bit about me. I'm an employment lawyer. I've been practicing employment law for the past uh, 16 years almost, uh, primarily in Texas, but I also do a lot of work here in Oklahoma. Um, I specialize in, among other things, um, uh, legal compliance with anti-discrimination laws, and that includes the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, like I said, I've been representing businesses for years. I've always worked for either large global law firms or in-house uh, for large global corporations. So this is kind of what I do, trying to make sure that folks at these, at my clients, understand what the law is, what it requires, and what's the best way to avoid the kind of sand traps that we can tend to get into. So that's kind of what we're going to be dealing with here today. Um, these are the topics that we're going to cover. Um, I will tell you in advance, I do not expect anybody to walk out of this room an expert on any of this. Um, I'm a lawyer, I've been practicing, like I said, almost 16 years, and you, if you ask me questions about some of this, I might have to go and check the statute, I might have to go and check a source. Um, but what I do want everyone to get from this presentation is a few things. Uh, just kind of a basic sort of working comfort with what the Americans with Disabilities Act is, what it requires of you as leaders, what it requires of the company, um, and just generally what are some of the best practices that you can apply in your day-to-day -day jobs to make sure that we stay on the right side of the line as far as ADA compliance goes. Um, a little bit about the law itself. Um, that's a blank slide. There we go. Okay, a little bit about the law itself. So I. I happen to, and I'll share my own personal story on this, um, I happen to be heavily involved with, live fairly closely with disability. Um, I have a brother-in-law who is severely disabled. He has very, very severe advanced cerebral palsy, uh, very limited in motion, zero mobility, wheelchair bound. And when most of us think of disability, that's kind of the image that pops to mind, the old handicap sign in the sidewalk on, on, the, on the parking space. Um, but the Americans, one of the things that's interesting is that according to the Social Security Administration, one out of every five Americans lives with some sort of a disability. Okay? One out of every ten Americans lives with a fairly serious disability. And historically, if you were an American with a disability, uh, life was very tough for you, including getting a job or keeping a job. Because most facilities, most businesses, most workplaces were not really set up to compensate for or to uh, accommodate folks with disabilities. So in 1990, Congress passed and President George H.W. Bush signed into law the Federal Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, we're going to be talking about Title I of that act today. It governs employment. There are other things. Title III, for example, is the one that governs how wide your doors have to be and what your wheelchair ramps have to look like and certain things regarding like uh, accessibility for the vision and hearing impaired. Um, Title II covers some other things, but we're going to be focusing on Title I here today, which deals with accommodating disabilities and recognizing disabilities within the workplace. Um, the Act covers all employers with 15 or more employees, so all but the smallest employers have to comply with the Act. Um, it also covers both employees and applicants. So it's not just the folks who are already working for the company, but it's the folks who want to be working for the company, who are trying to work for the company. Uh, it also covers people not only with disabilities, but people who are regarded as having disabilities, even if they don't have one, even if you just there's a presumption that this person has a disability, or if they have a record of a disability. Maybe they had a disability in the past, something in their files suggests they did, but they no longer have one. They're also protected by this act. Um, and the, the key to that is that if an employee or an applicant is going to be covered by the Act, they have to be, and I've highlighted it here in red, a qualified individual with a disability. So we're going to dive into some of these terms here. A qualified individual with a disability. Now, disabled or no, I can't walk in off the street to y'all's local hospital and apply for a job as a doctor. Okay? I don't have a medical degree. Right? I couldn't go be an aerospace engineer because I don't have the, the skills or the experience or the knowledge to do that. The Americans with Disabilities Act protects qualified individuals with disabilities. In other words, it protects employees or applicants who have the skills, the experience, or the educational or other job related requirements to do the job that they either have or that they're seeking. Um, that means that they have to be able to perform the essential functions of the job 
with or without reasonable accommodations. Okay, so that's really what we're going to be talking about here today. Um, a qualified individual with a disability, it's, it's interesting, is entitled to a sort of preferential treatment. Now, the Americans with Disabilities Act is an anti-discrimination law. It's, it's a form of civil rights law. And when you think of civil rights laws, you think of laws that are intended to make sure that nobody gets preferential treatment based on your race, based on your birth gender, based on your age, anything like that. The assumption is that everybody's going to be treated exactly the same. That's the whole idea behind these laws. But Congress recognized that in the context of disabilities, some folks who could otherwise do a job just fine may need a little bit of a leg up to get that playing field level. Okay? Maybe they're going to need some sort of, a, of special equipment. They're going to need some sort of special accommodation within the workplace. The goal of the law is never equal results. It's equal opportunity. It's to make sure that the playing field is just as level for workers with disabilities as for the rest that don't have disabilities. So they're still responsible. They have to be qualified. They have to meet the qualifications. They have to meet the performance standards. Since we're talking about disabilities, let's go ahead and define how the law looks at a disability. There are three elements. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and I'll refer to it as the ADA, under the ADA, a disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. A physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. That's what the law says it is, and anything that falls into that definition could be a disability. Now, again, I called back to my brother-in-law who has severe cerebral palsy. If you saw him with me, you would recognize that he has a disability because it's obvious, it's open. But not all disabilities are. Physical impairments can include not only obvious physical disorders and conditions, but some sort of physical conditions that you can't necessarily see. Digestive issues, nervous issues, skeletal, muscular, respiratory. Any sort of body system issue could be a, dis a disabling physical impairment. And the one thing, I've been doing this training, like I said, for well over a decade, and the thing that I get the most surprise among trainees from is the fact that mental impairments also fall into that. Dyslexia can fall into that. Addiction can fall into that. Alcoholism could be a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act because it is a mental impairment of some sort. Okay? And, and there's something to be pointed out, and I've got it highlighted there in red so you know it's important. Under the current law, nearly any non-temporary disorder or condition will call, qualify as a physical or mental impairment that could be disabling. I'll use as an example. Let's say that I fall down on the steps outside and I break my leg. Okay? Doctor tells me you're going to have the cast off in six months. That's a temporary condition, probably not going to be disabling. But then let's say I get the cast off and I've got severe pain. The bone didn't set right. I've got, I can barely walk. I can't stand for more than 15 minutes at a time. Now you're talking about a physical condition that could be a lasting, permanent, disabling impairment. Okay? So there, it's important to distinguish between the two. So the first part of the definition is that it's got to be a physical or mental impairment. And then it has to substantially limit one or more major life activities. So substantially limits. And I, I want to point this out. As a lawyer, I've learned this. I've had clients that have learned this the hard way. All of these terms that I'm talking about, the law defines this, the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which oversees this, courts that deal with lawsuits in this, look at these terms. They define them very broadly. Okay? So substantially limits. It doesn't have to be severe. It doesn't have to be significant, but it has to substantially limit the person who's suffering from it comparative to the rest of the population. I use the example of migraines versus regular headaches. I'm a lawyer. I got a headache every day. Okay? And sometimes when you got a headache, you push through it, you can work through it. it. It stinks, but you carry on. Maybe you take a Tylenol or an Advil and you get on with work. I've known people that had migraine headaches that were so severe that when, they, when one strikes, basically what their defenses are to take the pain meds, go to their room, turn off all the lights, and curl up in the fetal position in bed. There's kind of a spectrum of how that ailment, a headache, can affect you. The more it limits your ability to engage in certain activities vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the population, the more likely it's going to be considered to be a disability. Um, one other interesting thing, we also, when we're looking at that, whether something is disabling, a substantial limit on people's activities, we can't look at mitigating measures. Um, I, I mentioned on one of, a couple of slides back that there was an amendment to this law in 2009 signed by George W. Bush. Um, his father signed the original law into law. 
And one of the reasons for that amendment is that the Supreme Court had come down with a number of rulings that determined that workers didn't have qualifying disabilities under the act. And one of the more uh, infamous ones was an individual who had severe diabetes and had filed a claim under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that individual's employer said, well, you know, the guy isn't disabled because he takes insulin. So you'd never know that he had diabetes. And the Supreme Court agreed. The Supreme Court said, yeah, because he takes diabetes, his condition does not substantially limit his major life activities. He's able to mitigate it. Well, Congress came back and said that completely flies in the face of what, what we intended when we passed the act. So now when you're considering whether a worker, whether an employer, an applicant has a disability, you can't take those things into account other than glasses or contacts. So it has to be a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. What is a major life activity? Pretty much anything that you think of that if you couldn't do it, it would alter or impact the way you live your life negatively. I've given you a list up here that Congress and that uh, the EEOC have, uh, have issued as kind of guidance on this. It's pretty much everything. Um, prior to that 2009 amendment that Congress passed, I saw a couple of lawsuits or a couple of court decisions where judges held that driving was not a major life activity. Y'all live in Oklahoma City. Can you imagine not being able to drive, right? But then again, if you were to live in, say, Boston or New York City or someplace with a good, reliable public transportation system, maybe not. Again, remember that courts define this, the EEOC defines this, the government defines this very broadly. And I'll give you the example that I always like to use, and my wife kills me when she hears that I do this, as an example of how broad this is defined. Uh, we live in Austin. Any of y'all ever been to Austin? Okay. So if you've been there during cedar season, you know that we have cedar trees everywhere and that the cedar pollen is absolutely suffocating. I don't have cedar allergies and it's bothersome to me. Well, my wife has cedar allergies and when it's cedar season, she, her eyes water so bad on the worst days that she literally can't see to look at a computer and do work, much less drive. Uh, breathing can hurt so bad that she'll be laying in bed hacking and coughing for a day or two at a time, okay? Cedar allergies, it's a physical impairment, unquestionably. Substantially limits her ability to see, her ability to work, her ability to breathe. Sounds like a disability, right? And it could be under the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's at a different sort of end. That's a lot broader than what most of us think of when we have a default thought of what a disability is, okay? So that's more or less a definition of disability under the law. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when we have an employee or an applicant who actually has a disability, a disabling medical condition. The key thing that we're required to do is that we may be required to provide an accommodation to such a worker, okay? Um, the scope of that requirement is basically any sort of a work face, workplace modification that enables a qualified individual with disability to perform the essential functions of the job that he or she holds or wants to hold, okay? Um, and the way that we do that, and I'm gonna deal again with each of these uh, highlighted forms here, is through something called the interactive process, okay? and I'll explain that a little bit more later. The interactive process, I will warn you in advance, is the number one sticking point that I see as a lawyer, okay? Most companies want to accommodate, to do uh, the right thing for all of their workers, including their workers with disabilities, but often this is where people get the most hung up, okay? How do we know when it's time to accommodate? You know that you have the duty to accommodate typically kicks in when the company knows or has reason to know that the individual has some sort of a disability and that they need a reasonable accommodation to perform the job. There are no magic words required here. An employee is not required to say, I need a reasonable accommodation, okay? Oftentimes it's going to be obvious. Somebody has a disabling condition and they come to you and tell you, I can no longer type 50 words a minute. I can no longer look at a computer screen. I can no longer drive long distances at night, okay? Even though they haven't used the words reasonable accommodation, that can be enough to put the company on notice that, hey, we may need to accommodate this person because they've got some physical or mental impairment that's limiting their ability to perform the job. Um, I will stress, and I always stress this over and over again, when a person comes to you with information that, hey, I have this sort of a disability, I have some sort of a medical condition that may need an accommodation, first off, go directly to HR. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, go straight to HR. That's their job is to help work with this. But also understand, you wouldn't want your medical conditions to be shared with anybody else, right? 
So it's always important to treat people's disabilities confidentially as you find out about them. Keep them as confidential as you can while working to accommodate them. Again, you don't need to use any, or the employee doesn't you need to use any sort of magic words to uh, start the reasonable accommodation process. Um, and the request doesn't need to be in writing. Um, a company can, and I'm not familiar with whether we do, but some companies can uh, have, create forms and say, well, if you need an accommodation, fill out this form. And that's all fine and good, but if somebody has made it clear that they, they have a disabling condition that they need an accommodation for, and they don't fill out the form, that failure to fill out the form is not going to justify us not engaging with them and not trying to accommodate them. Okay? The law, again, interpreted very broadly to provide broad protections. And somebody not meeting an administrative point like that, that's not going to be enough to trigger disqualification from getting an accommodation. So what is the interactive process? It's pretty much what it sounds like. Okay? Once we know or have reason to know that a person has this disabling condition and they need an accommodation, they've made it clear to us that they can't continue to perform the job without something to help them perform one or more essential functions, then we sit down with them and we talk with them through it. What do you need? Right? And we can talk with them about, you know, it, it, it has to be a reasonable accommodation. Okay? Um, you know, I, an example that I like to use is this one. Um, and this is based on an actual case. It didn't quite get this far. Um, one of my clients had a worker with severe perfume allergies. Okay? They were allergic to everybody's perfume and cologne. Right? When they got into work and they started smelling you know, uh, you know, Dior Sauvage or whatever it is that Johnny Depp is advertising these days, it set off all of the triggers with the eyes watering and itchy skin. And so that was something that came to their manager. How do we deal with this? The person said, look, I can't continue to come into work every day if I know that I'm going to be itching and my eyes are going to be watering. I can't do my job. It's that impairing. Um, and this was a person who had to be in the workplace. They couldn't work from home. It wasn't something you could do remotely. Um, now, think about that for a second. As a manager, what might you do? Well, let's say you have an empty cubicle or an empty desk or an empty office that's away from the rest of the team but still close enough to where they can do functional work. Okay? That seems on its face to be a fairly reasonable way to accommodate somebody's perfume allergy. That's one extreme. But what if that person comes into work and says, yeah, that's not going to cut it? Because people that have been in that office have come in and they've worked with cologne and with perfume on, so I want you to have the whole office sanitized, rip out and replace the carpet. And oh, by the way, while you're doing it, nobody who comes into the workplace gets to wear perfume or deodorant or cologne anymore. Okay? That'd be kind of extreme, right? Sounds far less reasonable. I don't think anybody in this room, myself included, would want to be surrounded by a bunch of people not wearing deodorant all day. Okay? So you get that spectrum of what constitutes reasonable versus not. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Just some compliance tips, as I mentioned right up front, this, no, this interactive process part where we're trying to work with the worker through what constitutes a reasonable accommodation is the biggest speed bump in compliance. And as I point out there on the slide, typically the party who is responsible for the breakdown in that process, the one who's being unreasonable, the one who puts their foot down and says, no, we're not going to do this, that's typically, if it's the employer, that, that, that's very likely to get you into legal issues. And if you go before a judge and if you go before a jury, that's very likely to make you lose because we don't look very sympathetic if we're not seen as doing what the law tells us we have to do, which is trying to take care of workers with disabilities. Now, there are two other key points, and you know, again, they're key because I've highlighted them. Document everything. Okay? If you have a conversation with HR, if you have a conversation with the worker themselves about what they're asking for, what they're saying their limitations are, what they think they need, make a document of that. Make a note to file, send an email to the worker confirming what it is that they're asking for so we have a clear record of what we've done. Your good efforts as leaders should not go to waste. Right? It should, nobody should be able to go back and say, well, I asked her, I asked him for this, and I didn't get it. We want to make sure that the record is clear on that. And also, obviously, don't say dumb things or mean things. I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence, but most times that I handle a case that actually goes before a court, at least once every case I have to brace myself because there's going to be a some, e some email where somebody called the plaintiff some sort of a rotten so-and-so, and can you believe that this person asked for that? Keep the commentary out of these documents, okay? 
Understand that what you're doing is you're trying to make sure that we are doing the right thing and have a good record of it. And also, don't assume anything. Um, you know, I, a story that I share, and again, these, I, I share these true stories. Sometimes they're too amazing to believe. But uh, I got a frantic call one day from a client's HR representative saying, we've got this situation, I just don't know what to do with it. Okay, well, tell me about it. We've got a data entry position that we're hiring for. That's what the HR rep tells me. And one of the minimum requirements, one of the essential functions of the job is that the person has to be able to type 50 words a minute. And I'm like thinking that's about the limit of my ability to type competently. I'm like, okay, well, what's the problem? Well, we just had a guy come in and apply for the job and he doesn't have arms. What should I do? My, question, my response to them was this. Can he do it? Can he type 50 words a minute? Do you know that he can type 50 words a minute? And of course, the HR person didn't know because she made an assumption. She assumed that somebody who had arms, or do, who didn't have arms, couldn't type 50 words a minute. Well, as it turned out, that person ended up getting hired. He was able to enter 50 words a minute without arms. Okay, I, it, maybe common sense would reflect that that's not something that you should assume, but it shows you that you should never assume anything. One of the reasons that this law was passed in the first place is precisely to defeat the sort of assumptions that society has long had about people with disabilities. To make sure that if somebody rises or falls in the workplace with a disability, it's because of their skills, it's because of their drive, it's because of their value to the team, and not because of some assumption that was made about them. And also don't assume, by the way, on that same sort of thread, that an accommodation that worked for somebody else who had a similar disability in the past will work for the next person who comes along with that disability, whether it's vision impairment, hearing impairment, diabetes. Um, it, one of the things that Congress stressed and that the courts stress over and over is that when you are doing these analyses, when you are looking at reasonable accommodation and determining disability, every case is unique, okay? And each person's condition is going to be disabling or not disabling in a different way, okay? So always keep that in mind. Um, examples of possible reasonable accommodations I've listed some of them here. The universe of them is really limitless. It all depends on what the nature of the job is, what the nature of the employee's limitations are, and what the company's ability is to accommodate that person. Um, I will say that leave, which is right there in the middle, is almost always the trickiest one. Okay, and I'll explain that one why in a couple of slides from now. Um, but you see things, everything from modifications to the application process, uh, job restructure, removal or transfer of non-essential functions, letting people who can work from home work from home, um, providing readers or interpreters to people who are uh, vision impaired or hearing impaired. All of these things may be required reasonable accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay. Now, I talked a little bit about that kind of odd spectrum of the, you know, the, the person with the perfume allergy asking for all these outrageous things that there's no way that we should be required to provide. When does an accommodation become unreasonable as opposed to a reasonable accommodation? Well, the biggest one is that the company is not required to incur undue hardship, right? The law says that if providing the accommodation that the employee has requested would result in hardship, then an undue hardship, then the company is not required to provide it. That's a really high bar to clear, by the way. Um, I do a lot of work for big global companies that talk about how, oh my gosh, you know, this is going to cost thousands of dollars, you know, if we have to give this employee this piece of equipment or to, to do this for this employee, this accommodation. And then I'm, you know, I have to remind them that their, you know, their financials are publicly available and that if they try to go before a jury and say that it cost $2,000 for a multi-billion dollar company was too much to spend, we're going to lose that argument. But it does depend on the circumstances. It depends on how much it costs, the size of the company, how much it disrupts our operations to give that sort of an accommodation. Again, a very high bar, but not an impossible one. You just have to look at the circumstances. Um, some of the things that you don't have to do that are just de facto considered to be an, an undue hardship, you don't need to eliminate an essential job function, okay? If there's some part of the job that they're saying, I could do this job if only you would eliminate the, the requirement that I type 50 words a minute. Well, if that's a data entry position and that's the whole point of the job is typing quickly, you're not required to eliminate.
okay, to accommodate an employee with a disability. You don't have to create a brand new position and you don't have to bump other employees out of existing positions. Okay? I don't have to give someone your job or your job to accommodate them, right? But if there's an open position and they're qualified to perform it, then that may be a reasonable accommodation under the circumstances. Um, and then there's another one, also a very high bar. I don't see it very much. We don't have to accommodate where the employee's condition poses a direct threat either to the employee or to others in the workplace, be it customers, be it uh, coworkers, that sort of thing. And, and, and a final key one, the Americans with Disabilities Act requires us to engage in this interactive process, to talk with the worker, um, to find out what could possibly accommodate their limitations. It requires us to provide them with a reasonable accommodation, but it does not require us to provide them with their preferred accommodation. If there are multiple ways to accommodate a physical or mental impairment in the workplace, uh, we can choose the one that's most convenient for us as a company as long as it's effective, as long as it enables them to perform the essential functions of the job. Now, I'm not saying, and, and you shouldn't do this, we shouldn't just unnecessarily deny somebody a preferred accommodation. But if there's a good business reason that, we're not, that we couldn't give them, say, exactly what they want, but we can give them an accommodation that would make it just as easy for them, make it just as effective for them to perform the position, then by all means, we have the right to choose between multiple accommodations. So again, practical tips for accommodating employee, qualified employees or qualified individuals with disabilities. Again, HR, this is kind of what they do. I mean, this is right in their wheelhouse. And an experienced HR representative is going to be able to really jump right in and know exactly what questions need to be asked, what steps need to be taken, and to help you work through this. You as leaders are not alone, okay? You will have help from Company Human Resources in that uh, extent. Um, on the essential job functions part, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, don't just rely when you're trying to figure out, well, am I going to have to eliminate some essential job function to accommodate this person? Don't just rely on the written job descriptions. Every company has them. Um, and I was actually responsible for when I worked in-house at an in-house legal department for a large global tech company for reviewing their job descriptions. And I found that in about one out of every three instances, the person wasn't actually doing about half of what was in the description. Because managers change things up according to their local needs, according to the changes to the business. So don't just rely on what the written job description says when you're trying to figure out whether we can accommodate. Um, again, meet with the person. Engage in that interactive process face to face to the extent you can. And follow up with documentations. You know, Bob, following up on our meeting today. Here's what we talked about. Here's what I committed to do. Here's what you committed to do for us. Um, again, strongly consider what the employee prefers. Um, but at the end of the day, what's most appropriate for the business, we can do it as long as it's effective. In other words, it enables the employee to perform the essential functions of the job on that same sort of level playing field as his or her peers. And again, confidentiality, that seems to be obvious, right? You wouldn't want people knowing about your confidential medical information or your disab disability status. We don't want to share that with others any more than we need to. Um, and and I, I'll go back again. Congress made it really clear when they passed this law that one of the things that was victimizing individuals with disabilities in America was that there were hard-baked sort of assumptions and stereotypes about people with disabilities, what they could and couldn't do. The HR lady who calls me and says, hey, I got a guy with no arms who's applying for a data entry job. Turns out the guy could enter the data, but she just assumed that he couldn't do it because of the way he looked, because of his visible impairments. You can't do that. The law is specifically designed to combat that sort of reliance on stereotypes and assumptions about people. That's why the interactive process, that one-on-one -on -one engagement with workers, is so important. I talked again about essential functions of the job and my biggest, I guess, practical tip that I can give you is don't rely on what's written in the job description. If you as a leader have any doubt about what's in one of these descriptions where somebody's asking for an accommodation, if you're not sure exactly whether the, the, the accommodation that can be made fits with the, 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 the essential functions of the job, go talk to the people that are down there on the floor doing the job. Talk to the manager who's directly overseeing the workers. Um, you know, go talk to somebody in HR who may have more familiarity with the jobs than, than you do if you're relatively new. But find out whether or not the job functions are actually essential before we say that we can't eliminate or modify them. 
Um, I, I will give you an example of this, and it's one that I just handled for a very large global tech company again. Um, uh, this company has telephone-based customer service reps. So when one of their products or one of their services goes haywire, or you need to set it up or install it or whatever, you type in a number and you call the phone and, and somebody speaks with you live. You get a live representative standing by, right? Um, within the space of a couple of months, we had two individuals that were completely deaf apply for phone-based jobs. And of course, you know, there's kind of the, the natural instinct is to just assume that somebody who is 100% deaf, who can't hear, couldn't possibly be a phone-based customer service representative. One of the two employees was vocal. She could speak. She'd gone deaf at a very early age, but she'd learned how to speak. She could uh, you know, speak uh, understandably. The other one had been born deaf and was completely non-vocal. One of the things that I was interested to find through that interactive process, through working with management and HR, is that the vocal employee was actually able to do the phone-based job. There were software accommodations that could be set up, voice recognition software that picked up what the customer said, transferred it to a monitor that was built into her phone in real time, and she could give verbal responses to the customer. There was a slight delay, but it wasn't as bad as we thought it would be before we tested out the equipment, and it turned out that you have a completely 100% hearing impaired deaf person working as a phone rep, and most customers don't know. Now, we tried the exact same thing with the non-vocal employee using a, a, a signer, an ASL translator. It turned out that the lag was so substantial, right? And you had, the, the, the signer had to listen to what the person, the customer was saying, sign it to the person, the person had to sign back the answer to her, and then she had to tell the customer, which created a huge lag, not to mention the fact that it's tech stuff, so you've got all this tech jargon that the signer couldn't necessarily understand. That wasn't an accommodation we could do. Right? It turned out that hearing what the person on the other end of the phone was saying was not actually an essential function of the job. We didn't know. That was kind of a surprise to us. But being able to answer verbally, we found out that that was. It's an interesting example of, of, of the kind of the very thin slicing sometimes that comes into whether something is an essential function. Um, by the way, attendance almost always is. You've got to show up for work. Okay. Um, there are some times we're working from home or going out on leave to deal with a chronic condition or a, a disabling condition that's, that, 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 that keeps you out of the workplace for periods of time. That can be an accommodation, but just flat out not showing up for work ever, uh, that's not one that's, that's always going to be an essential function of the job. Um, Full-time versus part-time, however, might be a different story. Um, but again, my biggest tip, in addition to engaging with HR and engaging with the worker or the applicant, is to don't just rely on what the job description says. Make sure you fully understand what really are essential duties of the job. Um, I mentioned leave being a tricky one, okay? Um, those of you who have had folks who have applied for FMLA leave or who've gone out on workers' comp will understand exactly why that's the case. Um, FMLA, as I'm presuming most of you know, entitles uh, certain workers, people who've been with the company, say, for 12 months and worked for a certain specified number of hours during that time, it entitles them to up to 12 weeks of unpaid protected leave that they can take, come back, and still have their job waiting for them. Um, now, in the FMLA context, sometimes you can require a full release. Somebody, you know, we need you to be fully released to come back and perform uh, your job duty and to attend your job full time. Um, uh, the issue with FMLA leave exhaustion, again, you might not even qualify for FMLA leave because you haven't work in, been working for the company for 12 months, okay? So that doesn't qualify you into the FMLA. But the ADA doesn't impose any sort of requirements like that. As soon as you get hired, you're automatically protected by the ADA. So if somebody comes to work for, with us or for a week and then it turns out, hey, by the way, I've got this chronic condition that has flared up now and I'm going to have to be out for two months, we may have a duty under the Americans with Disabilities Act to provide them with leave, regardless of the fact that they don't qualify for it under the FMLA. Or let's say that somebody goes out on 12 weeks of FMLA leave, and this, is, this one is the most common leave issue that I've encountered. Somebody has a disabling medical condition that also, by the way, qualifies as a serious health condition under the FMLA. There's a lot of uh, overlap between the two. They exhaust all their 12 weeks of FMLA leave. And then HR or the leader for that person says, well, they've exhausted their FMLA leave. If they can't come back, time to start moving them out of the company. Not necessarily. If that serious health condition 
is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. It's not temporary, it's permanent or chronic. We may be required to give them more than that 12 weeks of leave, even though the FMLA, another competing federal law, says we don't have to. Um, I've seen people out on leave for as much as 18 months as an accommodation for a disability, where the business could not justify, you know, they, they may have wanted to get rid of the person, or and, and thankfully in most cases the business has been happy to provide the accommodation. Um, but just understand that just because somebody has exhausted their FMLA leave, if they have a truly disabling medical condition, um, they may be entitled to more than that 12 weeks. Uh, similarly, workers' compensation. I don't know how big of an issue that is for you guys, but workers' comp is a state law creature. I deal with a lot of workers' comp stuff here in Oklahoma, and the law defines disability very differently, very distinctly, depending on the condition, than what the Americans with Disabilities Act does. There's some interplay, there's some overlap. Um, so you might have somebody who is disabled under the Workers' Compensation Act with a temporary injury that would in no way qualify under the Americans with Disabilities Act. If you have somebody who looks like they're going to need accommodations coming back to work, light duty, whatever the case may be, off a workers' comp injury or off of an FMLA qualifying illness, again, immediately engage HR. Figure out whether this is something that we're going to have a duty to accommodate under the ADA. And finally, again, I don't know how much this one really ends up being applicable here, how much we have to do this, but the Americans with Disabilities Act importantly prohibits pre-offer medical questions on job applications. We can't ask people who are applying for jobs, do you have a disability that would stop you from being able to perform the minimum functions, the essential functions of this job? We can't ask that. Now what we can ask, and you see this on job applications, is we'll, you know, on the job application it'll say, you know, if hired could you lift 15 pounds? If hired can you type 60 words a minute? If hired can you travel six days a week, okay? That we can ask, but we can't ask these disability type questions, the medical questions, before we've made an offer of employment to a candidate. Once we have, however, uh, the ADA does allow for medical inquiries, okay? You can require medical inquiries, physical exams, after you've offered somebody a job, they've made it through the interview process, you've determined that they've got the qualifications, and now all that stands between them and working is them accepting that offer. You can put a physical exam or a medical inquiry in place then, but it has to be one that is given uniformly. In other words, not just because we suspect that a worker has some disabling medical condition that they're not being upfront with us about, okay? If there's a position for which, say for example, certain physical fitness standards are required, then we can require everybody who applies for that job to take a mental exam or to have certain medical certifications, but it has to be uniform, and I've seen <laughs> particularly careless clients decide that they're going to start doing physical exams all of a sudden when they suspect that one of their applicants has this, that looks bad, right? So now, one other question that's not on this slide and wasn't on one of the previous slides. Um, in, in the reasonable accommodation process, when a worker comes up to you and says, hey, or an applicant comes to you and says, hey, I have uh, a, a disabling medical condition, I'm going to need some sort of an accommodation for this. Um, under certain circumstances, we can ask for medical documentation on that, okay? If it's an obvious disability, you can't do that. I mean, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I just got my arm blown off and so I can no longer type with both hands, that's obvious. We don't need a doctor's note to tell us that, okay? But if it's one that's not obvious, we can ask for medical certification as to the nature of the limitation and to what sort of accommodations may be needed in order to perform the functions of the job, similar to what we do with FMLA leave. Um, and so that's pretty much what we're limited to on medical documentation. That's all I have. Um, but I'll leave you with this. Um, what I've really tried to impart during this training exercise is the idea that this law was designed to create a level playing field. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, you know, the, in recent years, uh, uh, unemployment among individuals with disability has been rising. As I mentioned at the beginning, the, the Social Security Administration estimates that as many as one in five individuals may live with a disability. Congress has made it very clear that it's important that individuals who have disabling medical conditions, be they physical or mental, um, are entitled to work on the same play, level playing field as the rest of us. And it's our job as a company, it's our job as leaders to ensure that we do everything we can to make sure that we are helping make that playing field more level rather than less level.
Thanks everybody, I appreciate it. I think the taping is gonna end and I will be happy to take any questions that any of you may have.